So in five, five day four, we're going to talk about the rational root theorem. Um, what the rational root theorem does is if a polynomial is completely mul multiplied out like we see here, um, it gives us a little direction on what numbers we could check that might be zeros. So yesterday, when we were starting to talk about division, how do we divide these out? Um, now we can just look at what are the options that we should try. And yesterday I was kind of starting to talk about that. So, so you know, I did talk about, hey, if this back number is whatever. So um, uh, all you need to know is that uh, any rational numbers, remember those are like uh, any number that can be written as a fraction, uh, that become zeros for this, the zeros um, always have to be in the form P over Q, the rational zeros. So um, uh, if this back number is a, a five and this back a front number is a seven, um, any number that divides evenly into five can go on top. Any number that divides evenly into seven would go on the bottom. And then those are the possibilities of the nice numbers that work. Now, it doesn't mean we have nice numbers that work, but it means that if they're not on that list, there aren't any, okay? So the easiest way for us to actually talk about this is to jump to problems one through four. It says, state the possible rational zeros for each function. So if you recognize that it's a polynomial, if it's in descending order, we need to list out what are the P's and what are the Q's. The P's are any integer that divide into our constant term, the, the negative one. So our P's could be plus or minus one. That's all that goes into one. Our Q's are any integer that divide evenly into the uh, the lead term coefficient. So in this case, our Q's are plus or minus three. So our possible zeros that are rational, nice. So our possibilities are all going to have to be of the list P over Q, all those combinations. So I always, oh, and also uh, don't forget, like I almost did, that one divides into three evenly. Okay, so if we take our P list and we divide it by one, one divided by one is one, so that is a possibility. But if we take our P list and we divide it by three, we get the possibilities one over three or plus or minus one third. So what does that mean? If this polynomial hits the x-axis at a rational number, it has to be from that list. So if we were to plug in one, negative one, three, one third and negative one third, if those aren't on the list, that means all the other zeros are either imaginary or square root of something, okay? So uh, that's all we're right, listing them right now in these top four questions. We're not doing them. We'll do them in the next four questions. Yes. That's a Q. That's a Q. Yeah. Okay, so let's do it again. Uh, in this particular case, our Q comes from the coefficient on the X to the sixth. Our P comes from the constant 64. So our P has lots of options, uh, lots of numbers that go into 64. So um, let's start listing those. Uh, plus or minus 64, uh, plus or minus one. I kind of think of it in pairs because if 64 goes into 64, one has to as well. Uh, 32 and two. Um, 16 and four. And then uh, eight and eight, but eight, okay. So uh, yes, you can go in least greatest order. I kind of think of what pairs are working together to go into 64 evenly. So what, do you, what exactly, like, do you mean like the parallel bonds? 
So P and Q are the integers that go into those particular coefficients. So our P is the integer that divides into our constant. Our Q is any integer that divides into our lead term coefficient. Okay. Any integer that divides into those things. Okay. So then our Q in this case is a one. The only thing that divides, the only integer that divides into one is one. And so if I divide my P over Q list We're looking. It kicked us off. So um, as we continue number two, uh, the P's over Q's are, you have to take the list of P's and divide them by the list of Q's. Well, the only Q's we're divided by are are uh, positive one and negative one. Um, doesn't do anything, right? Doesn't change the list. So our list is still, now let's put them in least to greatest order now. 64 plus or minus 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. So the possibilities for a number like 64 uh, are, pretty, are pretty extensive. So if I were to actually start to find those roots or zeros, um, I would definitely start with the small things. I would plug in positive one, negative one, positive two, negative two, positive three, negative three, or positive four, negative four. I would start out with the smallest possibilities um, to see what my possibilities are. Okay. Now we're going to do two more like that just to practice finding our P over Q before we actually jump in and actually use this information, okay? So our P in this case is anything that divides into 10. Remember, that's always our constant. That's gonna go on top of our fractions. So we get 10, five, two, and one. That's an easy one to put in least to greatest order. But again, any order, doesn't matter. You can just list them out. Our Q is any coefficient or any, um, I'm sorry, integer that divides into our front coefficient. So in this case, it's only one. So when our Q is one, it's nice because our P over Q is just the original list of 10, five, two, and one. So if we were to put this into decimals, uh, we would see that the zeros have to be on this list if they're a rational number. Now, again, that doesn't uh, account for if there's a square root of five sitting in there or a square root of seven sitting in there. Yes? I think it will become clear in the next problem, I would, I would think. So, so give it a second. <laughs> I think it will become clear for everybody um, after we do number four, so like in the next section. So uh, remember what we've done so far. We have found, um, uh, we have started to try and look if our function is in factored form, that's going to give us the zeros, then we'll be able to graph it. Um, uh, yesterday, we looked at polynomials where uh, it was a little harder to, to factor, so we used division. And so we're trying to be able to break up these polynomials so that we can put them in factored form. So that's our main goal, okay? Um, so let's do four one more time, and then I think the next section will kind of clarify what's happening. So again, uh, the list of possible zeros that are nice come from the 8, which is uh, plus or minus eight, four, two, and one. And our Q comes from the coefficient on our lead term. So that's only five and one. So four has some interesting possibilities. The possible zeros that are nice from this particular uh, set, if you divide it first, I always divide that initial list by one. 
because it's easy. Divide by one doesn't change. So let's write down the initial list, eight, four, two, and one. But now we have to divide the initial list by five, okay? So when we do that, uh, we get eight fifths is a possibility, four fifths is a possibility, two fifths is a possibility, one fifth is a possibility. So these are just a list of the possibilities that you would want to try to find a particular zero. So then we can do the division that we were talking about in five, five, day three. So it's just a matter of narrowing down your focus so you don't have to just try any random number on the number line. This narrows our focus so we can just try these particular list of numbers to start with, okay? So now the next uh, uh, section will probably blend uh, the information from yesterday and today's information together and kind of clarify how this helps us, okay? So now I want to do these problems where it says state the possible rational zeros for each function, then find all the rational zeros. So I am going to uh, do the little list for the P's and Q's uh, up to the right. So then I can start plugging stuff in um, and trying to figure out what is going to work and what is not. Well, the P's are any integer that divides evenly into three. So that's just going to be three and one. The Q's are any number that divides into our lead term coefficient of one. So that's plus or minus one. So our P over Q list is really just the original P list. Three divided by one, one divided by one. So it's just plus or minus three and plus or minus one. Okay. So it says, state the possible rational zeros for the function. That is this. That's the possible zeros that are rational and nice, okay? But it says then to find them. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start plugging numbers in. I always start with one and negative one because plugging in one we know is a nice thing. It's not quite as nice as plugging in zero, but it's a nice thing to plug in. If you plug in one, you get one plus one minus five plus three, which is indeed zero. Check. Now, what does it mean when we plug it in and it is zero? That means that X minus one is going to divide evenly. Now, it is your choice at this point what style of division you use, but your job is going to be to remove it. Now, this is a cube. So as soon as we remove it, we get a square, which might be factorable, or you can use a quadratic formula. So the hardest thing is finding your first one when you have a cube, and then the other two should kind of fall into play. Let me show you what I mean. Now, yesterday we talked about uh, synthetic division. We're going to put a one in the corner. We're going to write down our coefficients. 1, 1, negative 5, 3. We're going to make our synthetic division box. So remember, uh, this should be a technique you used last year. If your Algebra 2 teacher um, uh, made their box a little different and you like that, go for it. I, mine's just, you know, that's the way I do it. Okay. So remember how we do synthetic division. We multiply, write it down, add them up. Multiply, write it down, add them up. Multiply, write it down, add them up. We better get a zero remainder because we know it's a zero. If you don't, check your original math. Check your division. Those two should always link up. Okay. Now what we have found is that if we divide out x minus 1, we are left with, and I just always go next to h of x if they started with f of x. You can call it whatever, float your boat, don't care. Um, we got to put the x's back on. 
This was an x cubed. We go down one, now it becomes an x squared. So start with x squared and go in descending order. So this is one x squared plus two x minus three. Now, if all is right with the world, that is a factorable quantity. Thank goodness they were kind to us. It is a factorable quantity. That factors to be x plus three and x minus one. So let's join these two pieces of information together. We know f of x, when I took out an x minus one, I am left with an x plus three and an extra x minus one, okay? You could also rewrite this as x minus one squared times x plus three. There's a bounce at the x minus one factor. At positive one, there's a bounce on the graph. Now the question was to find all the roots or rational zeros. So the zeros occur when our factors equal zero. We already found that one. Remember that one was one we found earlier but we also now found an extra one, okay? The most rational zeros that a cube will have is three, but it can have less. The most that a fourth power can have is four, but it might have less, okay? So our answer to number nine is that we have a zero at one and negative three. And here we're gonna put that this is a bounce, and in some textbooks, they call this a multiplicity, meaning that x minus 1 multiplied together twice. And sometimes they will say a multiplicity. Of 2. So sometimes they'll call it a multiplicity uh, if there's a power on that particular thing. How many times did that 1 show up twice? Okay. Um, I don't care if you say bounce or multiplicity. I don't know what IMATH uses for that language. So I just wanted you to know what that term is referring. Does it have a power on it? That's a multiplicity. Okay. So uh, that is number nine. What is great about uh, being able to do this is we took a polynomial that I know the left end goes down and the right end goes up. But without doing this, I have no clue what it, the graph looks like. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm good at graphing stuff. And now I know it bounces at one and it goes through negative three. Left end down, right end up. I know where the bumps are. I, I can make a rough sketch really quick. So that's why this is so important that we're able to do it. Okay, let's do number 10. I'm going to put my P's and Q's up here. My P's are with the number 11. That's only 11 and one. Our Q's are only that positive coefficient of one on the X cubed. So our P's over Q's are 11 and one. Now we're gonna hope that either positive one or negative one is gonna be the answer to this. But you know, if it doesn't work, I'm gonna try 11 or negative 11. Now, it's a cube, so there are at most three zeros that we could find, three unique zeros that are rational. Uh, we may not find three. Okay. Um, let's plug in positive one. I will start with one. If that doesn't work, I go to negative one. If you plug in one, you get, um, you get zero. Good. Okay. The instant we find it, uh, you're going to divide out the factor that is in, uh, associated with 1. It's always x minus whatever you get. So x minus 1 is the factor we're going to divide out. Now, if you like long division, do long division. I'm going to do synthetic division. I'm going to put 1 in that corner. I'm going to write down my coefficients. I'm going to make my box. So now let's do our thing. Remember, we should get a zero remainder. That's what this uh, remainder theorem from yesterday tells us. If I plug in one, I get a remainder of zero. Um, so 
let's go for it and make sure that's what we get. Multiply, write it down, add them up. Multiply, write it down, add them up. Multiply, write it down, add them up. Our new function, call it something else besides f, I'll call it h, is x squared minus 12x plus 11. Thank goodness they're kind to us again. It's a factorable quantity. That is x uh, minus 11 and x minus 1. So our factored form of f of x, I took out an x minus 1. I'm left with an x minus 11 and an extra x minus 1. So we could write that as x minus 1 squared times x minus 11. Factored form is super, super helpful. We had a 1 that is a repeat again, and that's okay. So our zeros are at 1, which has a multiplicity of 2. It has a power on it of 2, and also at positive uh, 11, which doesn't have a multiplicity. We would go through 11 as we draw it. So this graph, if this is 1 and this is 11, we would have to bounce off of, a, of 1 but go through 11. So you can see how quickly we are then able to draw the graph of something like that. So um, this skill, it just is going to allow us to be able to graph something pretty quick. Okay, Everyone good with number 10? Okay, let's do it again, number 11. So again, let's do our P's and Q's. Uh, our P is two and one. Our Q is one. So our P's over Q's are just two divided by one, one divided by one, still two and one. That's all we got. When that front coefficient is one is always your original P list will match your p over q list. So we only have to plug in positive 1, negative 1, positive 2, negative 2 as our possibilities. If you plug in 1, you get something that is not 0. What do we get? We get uh, 10, 12. Do you see how all of our signs are positives? Um, if we stick a positive into this one, we're just going to get a positive number. Uh, so that's a clue that, that uh, our positive 1 and our positive 2 kind of can get shoved off the list. They're not going to give us the 0 we're searching for. So if negative does, 1 doesn't work, I'll probably try uh, negative 2. So I kind of will sometimes use a little logic to save myself some time. But if we plug in negative 1, what do we get? We get negative 1... Uh, plus 4 minus 5 plus 2, which is 6 and 6. Yeah, 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 yay! We get 0. Okay. So we found one. Earlier we found positive ones, not negative ones. And so now our factor is x plus 1. Let's always remember the opposite. So we're going to stick negative 1 in the corner. We're going to write down our coefficients. We're going to make our box. Remember, we better get a zero remainder because that is what that uh, plugging in that number implies. Okay. So multiply, write it down, add them up. Multiply, write it down, add them up. Multiply, write it down, add them up. We do indeed get what we expected. This factors. because we get x squared plus 3x plus 2, which is a factorable quantity. It is x plus 2 and x plus 1. We have a repeat this time. Our original function uh, would have x plus 1, x plus 2, and another x plus 1. And so sometimes the factor will repeat. That has a multiplicity 
uh, don't think that just because these ones have had to repeat, uh, the mathematician that made this worksheet uh, recognized that it's sometimes a little easier to uh, multiply it when it's that squared thing. So just a, a coincidence. Okay. Now we're going to do 13 while we're here. Um, we know that the zeros occur at negative one, which has a bounce, and negative two, which does not. Okay. So uh, because our lead term is x cubed, Uh, our left end is going to go down and our right end is going to go up. Our left end is going to go down and our right end is going to go up. Now our bounce occurs at negative two. Or I'm sorry, at negative one. So we're going to go through negative two and bounce. See how we make like a little parabola right there because it had a squared on it. So we're going to go through negative two bounce at negative one. We're going to go through negative two and bounce at negative one. Um, so see how easy. Now, if I see this, I go, I don't know. I know it goes le down left and up right, but even I don't know exactly what's happening until I get it into this form. So it's kind of a blending of what we've done all week long. Initially, we looked at this form. Then we talked about division, and now we kind of talked about how we could use that to help us break it apart. Okay. Is there any questions about 11 or 13? One last problem to do, number 12. For number 12, let's do our P and Q list. Uh, our P is uh, plus or minus five and plus or minus one. Our Q is plus or minus five and plus or minus one. Now all the other front coefficients were ones. Now we have a front coefficient that is five, okay? So let's talk about our P over Q list for this particular one. First, just divide the original list by one. 5 divided by 1 is 5. 1 divided by 1 is 1. So the original list is always kind of where I start. But if we divide the original list by 5, 5 divided by 5 is 1. It's already on the list. You don't have to write it twice. But is 5, or, or I'm sorry, is 1 divided by 5 on the list? No. Those are some new numbers. So we do have to add to the list 1 fifth. So plus or minus one-fifth now becomes a possibility. I avoid those possibilities unless it is a uh, one-half or negative one-half uh, until I run out of other options. I don't usually jump in and start plugging in fractions because uh, think about one-fifth to the third power. Not a nice number, okay? So I don't, I need those. They're going to help me because it's a possibility, but I'm not going to just jump to that. Okay. So I have to start plugging in. Where do you start? Uh, I plug in one. I plug in negative one. I don't think one's going to do it for us. Um, uh, I think we get, let's see, if I plug in one, um, I get a pretty large positive number. So that's not equal to zero. You can test it for me, but it's not zero. But if I plug in negative one, it might work. No, it doesn't either. Um, I think if we plug in negative 1, because we get negative 5 plus 29 minus 19. Oh, we might. We might. We might. Let's see. Yeah, I spoke too soon. That is equal to 0. Okay. Yay. Because now we know that x plus 1 is something I can factor out. I can remove that factor. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to put negative 1 in the corner. We're going to write down our coefficients 5, 29, 19, and negative 5. We better get 0 because that's what our uh, remainder theorem told us, that we should get 0 if we plug in uh, negative 1. So let's do the math. Uh, negative 1 times 5 is negative 5. Write it down. Add them up. 
multiply, write it down, add them up, multiply, write it down, add them up. Perfect. Okay. So our new polynomial, smaller polynomial, went from a cube to a square. This is 5x squared plus 24x minus 5. Now, if you're good with factoring, great. Hopefully, you know that that's a factorable quantity. But if you suck with the rules of factoring, I would like to show you a little trick that uh, I think is a really good way to factor this quantity. It's called slide and divide. Okay, I'm going to show you this trick called slide and divide. Now, if you learned um, another trick, uh, asterisk method, guess and check, if you like all those other methods you have learned about factoring quadra or quadratics, I, I go for it. I don't care. But I'm going to show you a little trick, okay? We're going to take this 5 and we're going to slide it over and we're going to multiply by what it is on the end. We're going to factor x squared plus 24x minus 25 because I know my students are much better at factoring this than that. So I'm going to slide it over. I'm going to do the math. Well, when I slide it over and do the math, uh, it is really clear now that this is x plus 25 and x minus 1. I bet you everybody in this room could factor that, but I bet you half of you would get this one wrong. I'm just telling you. So this little slide and divide trick works. Now I called it slide and divide. I slid it over. I did the factoring. I haven't done the divide off yet. What number did we slide over? A five. So we're just going to put a little under a five here. Okay. If the number sitting there is divisible by five, divide it. If the number isn't divisible by 5 and the fraction is reduced, stick the 5, uh, that de denominator, stick it on the x in that particular function. So that's 5x minus 1. I have just factored it. This is x plus 5 times 5x minus 1. Now, if you don't believe me, you can foil it all out. You will get 5x squared plus 24x minus 5. The front to make a 5x squared. The back makes a negative 5. The inner and outers do indeed make a positive 24. Okay, so let me go over the slide divide method one more time. Take your front coefficient, slide it over. Do the math. Whatever you get, whatever you slid over, divide that uh, numerical portion by it. If it doesn't divide properly, stick that coefficient on your x. It works every time. Just a nice way to do it. Uh, if, if you uh, went to a school, they do some, some schools do this asterisk method. It's just the asterisk method kind of in a slightly different manner, but other methods, it's, it, you'd get the same answer. Okay, so now we know the factored form is x plus 1 x plus 5, and 5x minus 1. Now, they didn't ask for the factored form. What they asked for were, were the zeros. So let's talk about the zeros. None of our zeros have a multiplicity. They're all unique and different and wonderful. Our zeros are negative 1, negative 5. Oh, let's look at this one. We would have to, if we set 5x minus 1 equal to 0, we get 1 fifth. Wasn't 1 fifth on our list anyway? Do, do you see the 1 fifth sitting right here? It's there. It's 1 fifth. All those numbers were numbers on the list. The reason a fraction comes out is because of the coefficient wasn't 1 anymore. If the coefficient is anything else, you'll get a fractional answer. Um, but I don't worry about the fractions if I don't have to until the very, very, very last step. And then I'll worry about the fractions, okay? So this is now done. Please turn it in. Go to iMath for me. And if you please could open up your iMath calendar.
open up your iMath calendar. So today on the cal uh, calendar uh, says pre-class 5-5. Five five. Open that up. We're going to... So if we look at our first question, you want to put your f of x function, in my case it's x cubed minus 5x squared plus 2x plus 8, into decimals. And uh, then we can answer the questions. So the first question that it says, it says um, uh, the root for the function is an actual value of the input that makes the output or the y value zero. Um, we can see them on the graph here. In my particular case, uh, that happens at negative one, two, and four. And that's what we're gonna do in B where it says what are the roots, we're actually gonna put those uh, x values in. The root in these uh, functions are, are gonna be negative one, two, and four. Now the vertical in intercept of the function. The intercept we want to always think of as a coordinate point, a point on the graph. Now this is the point on the graph that lies on our dependent variable axis or our y-axis. So that's why you'll see that I have entered the point 0, 8. So go ahead and enter your function in Desmos and then practice finding what are your roots and what is your vertical intercept. So for the roots, they just want those x values for the vertical intercept, they want the actual coordinate point. Now, if we look at our question uh, that follows here, we've got this function set equal to zero. It says, which of the following expressions might be equal to zero? Now, a uh, function equals zero where a factor containing an x is equal to zero. So two does not contain an x, so we don't include that. Uh, we see a factor of x plus four, x minus three, and x minus five, so you have to include that. You wouldn't include a, a singular value of x unless there was an x sitting by the two. Um, so that is the things that might be equal to zero. And then how you actually solve B um, is you actually can uh, set each one of those equal to zero. And you see how they're the opposite signs we got. So for x minus 5, I got positive 5. For x minus 3, I got positive 3. For x plus 4, I got negative 4. So you're just going to set each of those factors equal to zero and solve. Make sure you separate your answers by commas. Then if you scroll under the videos and watch those videos if you get a chance to. We have a function that is written in factored form and uh, they want us to find the roots. Um, and so the zero product property says that we can look at where x plus two equals zero, x minus one equals zero, or x minus seven. And that's what they're asking us to do for a, b, and c. Go ahead and solve each one of those. You'll see they give us the opposite answer. So x plus two got us an answer of negative two x minus 1 equals 0 at positive 1, x minus 7 equals 0 at positive 7. So that's what you're looking for for that one. And then finally, this time we're going to actually factor. Now when you're factoring something like x squared minus 2x minus 80, let me remind you how that quadratic works. We need the factors of 80 that have a difference of 2. Well, 8 times 10 is 80. 8 and 10 have a difference of 2. We need the 10 to be the negative and the 8 to be the positive. So we get that negative 2x in the middle. So that middle sign kind of tells us where do we put that larger value. We set that negative next to the larger value. And then you're just going to solve each one of them. Uh, x minus 10 equals 0 at 10. x plus 8 equals 0 at negative 8. Those are the zeros you see there in B. See how they switch sign again? And if we know we're right, uh, if you were to put that into a graphing calculator like Desmos, if you look at this graph, you can see 
that we hit the x-axis in two spots. We hit it at positive 10 and negative 8. So all of those pieces of information, the algebra should confirm what the graph also tells you. So there you go. Uh, that is your pre-class 5-5. So that should be done. And make sure you turned in your notes today and work on homework for the rest of class.